Thank you. Um, for the final talk of the afternoon, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Peter Payne, who's giving us the state-of-the-art lecture, First Do No Harm, Walking the Gut-Brain Nutrition Tightrope, which is quite a tightrope to walk for those of us who are involved. I think I first met um, Peter probably over 15 years ago when we visited the intestinal failure unit at Salford, and um, his erstwhile colleague, John Schaffer, was showing us through the... Uh, um, through the um, the area with all the cafes and, and uh, shops and so on. And uh, by that time, we'd been there a little while, and I thought John was a nice guy. And I, I said, um, John, do you, do you have any patients on home parental nutrition uh, for whom you, don't, you, know, you haven't actually got any organic diagnosis of any organic disease? And he inclined his head to a large lady who was just coming out of the cafe, wheeling her drips down with a TPN in one arm and carrying a, a, an armful of buns and crisps in the other. So, Peter... Uh, please give us all the solutions. <laughs> well, I, I think, Mark, I might just raise as many questions as I do answers, but it's a great pleasure to take part in today's conference and to talk about this really challenging walk, uh, of the gut-brain nutrition interface, this tightrope walk, with an emphasis on avoiding and reducing harm. And it really is a tightrope walk, trying to balance the scientific mechanistic aspects with the art holistic mechanistic uh, holistic aspects, trying to maximise the objective benefit of clinical assisted nutrition hydration, whilst avoiding being pressurised too much by subjective symptoms, uh, being aware though of the need to address uh, psychological and sensory aspects without being too railroaded by simple gut motor measures. Avoiding the professional hysteresis of lagging behind where the developments are, but not rushing headlong into the hysteria, which is abounding in this area at the, at the moment with uh, a lot of patient activism, so we remain true patient advocates. Now, one thing that's missing from this picture is this guy looks way too chilled, because the reality of working at this neurogastronutrition interface at the minute is it does feel like you're under attack from all sides. And the reason for that, this is billed as a state-of-the-art lecture, is that the art is in a real state. It's rushing ahead at the moment of where the science is at. So what do we do in this hiatus while we're waiting for the science to catch up? I'm going to argue that we need to become more artful. Artful dodgers twisting away from the harms that are presenting themselves to us. Um, being as wise as serpent, as, as innocent as doves, and I hope it comes as no surprise to anybody when I suggest that the way forward is biopsychosocial, multidisciplinary, multiprofessional, and multimodal. We're going to focus on four hot topics in particular, perhaps more hot water, but, but I'd suggest the metaphor is, here is hot soup, because these four are all intimately interrelated. We can't talk about one without the other. And we're going to talk about the rising tide of patients with hypermobile spectrum or hypermobile EDS in the accompanying labels of mast cell activation and POTS, who are increasingly presenting for escalating levels of nutrition support. We're going to look at the somewhat helpful collapse of the gastroparesis label into functional dyspepsia and other nausea and vomiting differentials. We're going to talk about why it's important to differentiate chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction from non SIPO. And we're going to talk about the emergence of the avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. So I've said that, uh, part of the title, we need to try and avoid and reduce harm, primum non lacera. So how do we do that? We need to be aware of where the harms are coming from. What are the harbingers of harm? First of all, I'm going to suggest, and there's some evidence, that some of the harm is coming here from the labelling. <clears throat> there's an over-labelling happening of gastroparesis, which has an interventionist trajectory based on a uh, simplistic gastric emptying studies alone without appreciating their pitfalls or the, con the contexts. There's an overlabeling of dysmotility and malabsorptive intestinal failure with no objective evidence of either of that. Probably an overlabeling of hypermobility. Definitely an overlabeling of mast cell activation syndrome without a raised cell, mast ma cell tryptase level in sight. An overlabeling of histamine intolerance, possibly an overlabeling of POTS. The flip side of that, however, is there's an underlabeling happening, an underuse of functional dyspepsia, which has much greater explanatory power and a less interventionist uh, trajectory, and some specific remediable conditions like rumination, cyclical vomiting, narcotic bowel, and ARFID. But underlying both these is an over-reliance on what are seen as watertight diagnostic labels. And we might learn something from the psychology-psychiatry interface where psychologists suggest we need to abandon labels to some degree and think about formulations, what are the components and the processes 
underline a narrative diagnosis at the individual level. So labeling is a major driver and source of harm here. And particularly labels like gastroparesis are leading to lines and tubes. And there's evidence that this group of patients are particularly vulnerable to complications, for example, catheter-related bloodstream infections with PN, particularly, I'm really lab uh, laboring the L's here, laudanum, tincture of opium. And we're still using opioids in this group of patients, and there's really no good justification for it, and it is associated with increased harms. Intravenous cyclosine is venotoxic and also addictive and should also be avoided. We're going to see the online world is playing a harmful role here, both the patient, the private, and in unregulated industry. And legal liability, complaints, coroners, everything in between. And low body mass index, micronutrients, electrolytes. You'd think in a talk about the interface between nutrition and neurogastro, that would be at the very top of my list. But it's surprising how many times patients with a normal or high normal body mass index with no objective evidence of malnutrition get referred for invasive nutritional support um, just based on symptom criteria alone. So let's apply our biopsychosocial sieve here. We've got these biological constructs. We've got the hypermobility and associated labels. We've got the foregut functional dyspepsia gastroparesis. We've got the midgut, SIPO, non-SIPO, and the avoidant restrictive food intake disorders. And I've said these aren't watertight. They bleed into each other. And the reason for that is they share some common psychological processes, in particular, a core of anxiety associated with sensitivity with a central component and a fear avoidant behavioral repertoire. And this triple whammy has crucial implications for how we approach nutrition here. Do we continue to exclude more and more dietary factors? Or do we adopt a nutritional rehabilitation approach where patients are exposed and desensitized in the face of ongoing symptoms um, as, a, as an alternative? And when Engels created the biopsychosocial model back in the 1970s, I think his mind would have been blown. He couldn't envisage the role that social media would be playing. Chronic illness identity, chronic illness influencers, chronic illness activists, and chronic illness adverts are playing a bit of a vicious cycle role here. And my contention in the UK is we need to understand and engage with this aspect probably more than any other if we're really going to get to grips with this. This is a reason why. This is a... Uh, high profile and uh, you know, public domain um, example of a young lady where these strands come together. She had a reaction to roast potatoes that led to a diagnosis of hypermobile EDS. She had a test that showed her uh, stomach was partially paralyzed. She'd previously had an eating disorder approach and now here she is on social media with the, uh, the feeding tube at the bottom there and the, the plate of parental nutrition on the top. And by way of editorial balance, also from the BBC News website, Munchausen's by internet, a chronic illness influence is really faking it. And evidence presented there that some chronic illness influences are monetizing, glamorizing, and weaponizing their chronic illnesses. And the example is given of a patient using fecal matter to contaminate and cause infections in her feeding lines in order to drive up her followers and likes on, on her website. So let's talk about hypermobile spectrum disorder, this very loose group of patients, hypermobile EDS, slightly better defined phenotype, presumptively genetic and autosomal dominant, but no genetic basis has yet been determined, unlike classic EDS, where we know all the genes. And that's in part because this has been a recurrently redefined and reconstructed phenotype. You could argue that the bendy biomarkers are themselves very bendy and open to disagreement. And the folklore associations with uh, um, POTS and with uh, mast cell activation are yet, not yet firmly epidemiologically proven. But what is clear that we have a specific problem with this in the UK. I was part of a uh, European-wide intestinal failure unit survey and the UK has a specific problem compared with the rest of Europe in terms of referrals of hypermobile patients up to the IFU level. So that's somewhat evidence uh, to prove this point that it's not just the biological and the psychological at work here, there's something in the medical sociology culture of the UK that's driving some of this that we need to engage with. What we know is that hypermobile patients have a greater interoceptive sensibility, a greater awareness of what's happening inside, and the same group found a big overlap with fibromyalgia, suggesting that there may be a peripheral small fiber neuropathy um, at the basis of some of this, which is the case uh, increasingly with evidence around fibromyalgia.
And it's certainly the case that um, patients, hypermobile patients with reflux have more hypersensitive esophagus, but no more, are no more likely than any other patients with functional dyspepsia to have a gastric motor problem. What's emerging is being described as a neuroconnective phenotype in this group of patients, a core of anxiety with the other symptoms and behaviors clustered around it. And when applied in particular to nutrition, this group of patients have hyperalgesia, pain is more painful, they have the inter interoceptive sensibility to have the somatosensory amplification. They're more likely, therefore, to develop painful or difficult eating and fear as a consequence of that pain. What's, what's, uh, you know, what, what's the significance of this pain? That, in turn, leads to eating avoidance, food selectivity, and disordered eating behaviors. And this is exactly, as we'll see, uh, fulfills the criteria for an avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. It's also important to be aware that combined with this, because gastroparesis often comes into the differential with, with, with hypermobile patients, is that the gastroparesis label is increasingly unsustainable and is collapsing into functional dyspepsia and other differentials. For at least 10 years, leading European uh, figures have been arguing that functional dyspepsia and gastroparesis are not two distinct uh, conditions, and they've been arguing for using the term functional dyspepsia as the umbrella term with or without delayed gastric emptying. But perhaps the final nail in the coffin has come this year in gastroenterology when the largest North American gastroparesis consortium have longitudinally followed their patients up with serial uh, gastric emptying studies and they found that based on gastric emptying studies these patients will flip-flop between the different diagnostic categories with no change in their symptoms at all. So very powerful and they've argued abandon both terms and just talk about neuromuscular disorders of the stomach. There was a lead editorial in clinical gastro HEP this year calling for the, asking the question, is it time to abandon doing gastric emptying studies altogether in this group of patients? But certainly what's emerging is that below the labels, there's a spectrum here of sensory, sensory motor, motor and psychosocial issues. So again, thinking more of a formulation mechanistically, what kind of symptoms are, are driving patients, what are, what are the mechanisms under, underlying. Some patients have impaired accommodation that may respond to busperone. A lot of patients have hypersensitivity and there's a range of neuromodulators that might help them. Delayed gastric empty may be present, may respond to prokinetics. We still need to be aware of H. pylori. Uh, focus on the duodenum and intraduodenal sensitivity, low-grade duodenal inflammation that might respond to antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers. Some patients have a post-infectious course. Uh, there is evidence of interstitial cell of cahal loss, gastric dysrhythmias, electromechanical dissociation, but I think most colleagues are really lost enthusiasm for gastric electrical stimulation in this group of patients now with all the complications they seem to get. And slight concern for patients with a core of anxiety and pain sensitivity as attention shifting to the pylorus, looking at even more invasive approaches like Botox and POEMS, which surely can't be the right way to go if you're dealing with a pain and anxiety disorder greater appreciation of other conditions like rumination syndrome that might be helped by diaphragmatic breathing, and brain-based conditions like psychical vomiting, cannabis hyperemesis, and chronic unexplained nausea and vomiting, which again might be helped by neuromodulators. And it, we have to keep reminding ourselves that the psychosocial is playing a big role here too. Moving down to the mid-gut, chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction is dilated small bowel with no obstruction. Enteric dysmotility, is no small bowel, small bowel dilatation or obstruction, but abnormal monometry in transit. Narcotic bowel is uh, where opioids can mimic features of either and should be reversible on stopping the opioids. And some people are beginning to use the term functional intestinal failure to describe a mainly pain or sensory driven or uh, untested or no abnormal test group. Together, they comprise the non-SIPO group. <clears throat> Why does that matter? Gregor Lindbergh's group in Sweden have shown that CPO patients are most likely to need to be on PN and stay on PN, whereas the non-CPO group less likely so. And the CPO group have a worse survival outcome as well. Our own group in Salford have found that the non-CPO group in light grey there are much more likely to be able to be weaned off of uh, PN, up to 50% of them. And then lastly, coming back to the uh, avoidant restrictive food intake disorders. As we've seen that with the hypermobile patients, these patients have a sensory sensitivity, a fear of the aversive consequences of what those uh, sensations mean, and some have early satiety and postprandial fullness. But the dilemma for us in gastro is, are we talking about 
Are they just the same thing? Is a disorder of gut-brain interaction and an ARFID, are they just different language describing the same thing? Or are they comorbid? Do patients have both a disorder of gut-brain interaction and an ARFID? Or is one leading to the other? It's the classic chicken and egg situation. What we do know is 40% patients with a gastroparesis or functional dyspepsia label also fulfill ARFID criteria. We know that 25% of tertiary neurogastro patients fulfill ARFID criteria with fear avoidance as the main factor. Flipping it the other way around, 30% of ARFID patients fulfill criteria for a disorder of gut-brain interaction with, again, fear, of avo fear avoidance as the major factor. And ARFID patients with GI symptoms, again, it comes again and again, study after study, fear avoidance. A little bit of a warning shot that NG tube feeding might actually impair nutritional rehabilitation and psychological recovery in ARFIDs, and also overly restrictive dietary approaches also might, uh, might impair recovery and progress. So this uh, slide came up earlier. Um, fear avoidance we've come across time and time again. So just to walk us through this, Patients may have abdominal symptoms. There may or may not be any peripheral event associated with that, but they experience pain. Fear is a very normal, natural reaction to a pain event, but with chronic pain over time and with an explanation that there's nothing dangerous underlying this pain, it's what happens next that counts. So a fear avoidance approach associated with catastrophizing, inflexibility, hypervigilance is more likely to lead to disability Whereas a fear confrontation approach, and I think we've all become uh, converts to mindfulness today, I certainly have, I'm still feeling quite chilled from the earlier talk, other therapies are available, is more likely to lead to rehabilitation and recovery. So how do we move forward with these patients? How do we engage ourselves at that neurogastronutrition interface? Well, when we as a nutrition support team are faced with this seemingly forced binary choice of tube feed or not tube feed, we find it helpful to ask some underlying questions. Firstly, are there objective indicators for clinically assisted nutrition and hydration? As indicator, are they actually malnourished? As goal, we know we can help malnutrition with these interventions, but not necessarily symptoms. Again, what's the diagnosis and mechanisms? Avoiding overlabeling um, and thinking about the individual formulations and mechanisms for a more targeted approach. And lastly, is optimized effort for, that's to say, symptomatic oral eating and drinking the least worst option. That would be in keeping with a nutritional and psychological rehabilitation approach and avoiding being too excessively avoidant and restrictive. We, as a nutrition support team, again, are constantly uh, minding the gap between what a patient reports they're eating, just a cup of tea and a biscuit a day, and what their uh, objective trajectory is telling us. I mean, we have to sometimes ask ourselves, are these patients photosynthesizing? Because otherwise, they are truly a medical miracle. So being aware of that physiological gap. Reverse the reversibles. Stop the opioids. Address the psychological distress. Treat symptoms where you can. And avoid being railroaded by subjective sensory distress on the one hand, but simplistic over-interpretation of motility tests on the other. And patients who end up on... Uh, PN or on tube support, let's keep our eyes on the exit all the time. Can we wean these patients from PN to enteral to oral? We might have to be very patient in that process and take little pigeon steps up and down in how much calorie support they get and being prepared to, prepared to pause for periods of time and crucial to that is monitoring, weighing and their bloods. So that guy on the tightrope can't, can't do it on their own, it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. Now, I say multi-professional, meaning this, that I don't think one consultant can do it on, on their own. We have three consultants. We uh, share very complex patients together to ensure that we've got a team-based approach to decision, that there's not so much chance of, of splitting, um, and that there's a consistent message. But it's also multidisciplinary and multimodal. So our nutrition support team has a nurse, dietitian, physician, psychologist, and pharmacist. And NICE says every trust should have a nutrition support team. But also think wider than that. Involve your neurogastroenterologist, your mental health team, the IFU, community and GP, gastroenterology, and your chronic pain team. I'm not going to pretend that it's easy. Um, it still remains a tightrope warp. But I, but I hope what I've described is an approach which is more balanced, which is biopsychosocial, which is team-based, and ultimately safer at this gut-brain neurogastronutrition interface for both the patients and for the teams who are doing the best to support them.
Thanks very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Peter. Um, that was a very comprehensive and, and gave us much food for thought. Um, we might have a time for a question. Thanks, Peter, for that wonderful talk. I just wanted to know your experience with uh, metazapine for individuals who have got functional dyspepsia and ARFID, because there is some data suggesting that that, that is of benefit, and I've started yeah. using it. Just wanted to see. If yeah, I, I, I'd, well. I'd say for four gut uh, sensitivity and satiety problems, it, it's 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 got some evidence to support it. And I've certainly used it. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can't say it's been transformative in, in all the patients I've used it, but I, I think there is evidence base, and it is probably a go-to neuromodulator. Can I just ask one quick question? Do you use the opioid antagonists when you're trying to get people off? The only good opioid is a dead opioid. <laughs> just, just get rid of them. So the trouble is, at very, very high doses, those periphery acting mu opioid receptor antagonists don't really work that well. They're really designed for people on low, stable doses that have got constipation. So most of, most of these are, patients are on very high doses, unsafe doses. And the Royal College of Anaesthetists uh, Opioid Aware Campaign draw your attention to that. They're saying if patients have got chronic pain and still on opioids, get them off the opioids, even if there's no other drug available to go on because, because of the harm. Thank you.